6 o'clock news starts right now. A lot of action on the radar right now to the northeast and east. A busy weather day continues. Adam Kasky tracking it all. He'll have an update on your forecast coming up in just a few minutes. As we enter property tax season, a struggle between local and state officials continues with homeowners caught in the middle. Governor Greg Abbott today said he will not freeze property appraisals this year, even in the midst of COVID 19's pandemic. Dylan Collier with more on what the next few months could look like. David Bassioli has a semi retired income and owns a home on the city's northwest side. When he went online recently to check the appraised value of his house this year compared to last year, I was shocked. County appraisal records show the market value went from $160,000 to over $189,000, an increase of nearly 30 grand. A 10% cap kept the assessed value from rising the full amount. But still, it's been a tough pill to swallow for Bassioli in this indefinite season of trimming budgets. We're looking at, you know, um, God, how can I cut and just do without? March 20th, city and county leaders authored this letter to Governor Greg Abbott, asking him to freeze appraisals this tax year. But nearly two months after that letter was written, officials say they haven't gotten any guidance from Governor Abbott. What determines how much a person pays in taxes? Today, KSAT asked the governor directly during the news at noon if he planned to suspend property appraisals. We are not going to make any type of state law modifying what a person's home value is worth. Uh, instead, what is required is the local taxing entities are going to be required uh, to have best practices uh, to reduce the property tax rate so that it will not be punishing to these property owners. Property tax protests are expected to be high this year, leading to concerns about how these appeals can be properly heard while potentially keeping hundreds of people a day socially distant from one another. Unfortunately, I may have to go down there to explain my case. You have a good one. Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. This afternoon, Judge Nelson will send out this response to the governor's interview. He says, quote, I am very disappointed in the governor's reaction to this, end quote. The judge went on to say that this decision will put more people at risk for exposure to COVID-19 because of in-person property tax protests. We'll hear more from that conversation with the governor coming up and we'll have our daily update from Mayor Ron Nuremberg and Judge Nelson Wolf coming up in about 10 or 11 minutes. Plans are being mapped out for criminal district court proceedings to resume slow and methodically. They've been shut down since March after jury service was put on hold due to concerns over the spread of the coronavirus. Paul Venema with where and how the reopening will begin. These remote hearings have been the norm for about two months now, but that's about to change. Administrative Judge Ron Renhell is proposing guidelines for conducting in-person, non-essential hearings. Something that is not going to resolve a case, something where a defendant is on bond, something where there is a civil type case where it's just a hearing and it's not going to be anything that relates to um, some sort of safety issue. No firm date yet, Runhell said. Too many moving parts. Start very slow, make sure the protections are in place. Um, we're consulting with Metro Health to make sure that we comply with everything that they request. That means masks and social distancing. Though the hearings will be in person, Runhell said remote hearings are likely here to stay. The idea is if you're able to communicate through electronic means such as this, we should continue to do so. What kind of pushback, if any, are you getting from the attorneys involved? Is, is, is everybody on board with your plans at this point? You have all different types of mentalities, all sorts of philosophies on, on how to ramp back up. Um, if there's any push, if there's any pushback, it's not much. He said everyone is concerned about the backlog of the court system and anxious to get moving, even if it's slowly. Paul Venom, a case at 12 News. We told you off the top of the show we are monitoring the weather situation. Well, things seem to be percolating out there a little bit, Adam. Yeah, we have a new uh, severe thunderstorm warning that's in effect for Kamal County, and this is basically moving into the 281 corridor. Let's take a closer look at it here, and we'll get uh, a fresh perspective on this storm and a diff different look on the radar screen. Now, this thunderstorm could have some quarter size hail as it moves to the southeast at about 25 miles per hour. There it is. You can see it 
Moving to the southeast, it's on the 281 corridor, basically right in Kamal County, north of Bulverde at this hour. This is pushing to the southeast, and it is a severe thunderstorm. Primary threat being large hail up to one inch in diameter, and there could be an isolated wind gust of 60 miles per hour. I'll have another update on this coming right up. All right, thank you, Adam. A drug that has been used successfully against Ebola, making news here in San Antonio. Remdesivir has made it through another major milestone in treating coronavirus. Ursula Perry explains the role South Texas played. We first heard about remdesivir as one of several drugs being put to the test in the first clinical trials by UT Health and University Hospital back in March. There was near panic back then to find a drug to ease COVID-19. Today, that worry is being replaced with progress. The second phase of clinical trials have now begun, the first phase showing it does make a difference. The study showed that COVID-19 patients who took the drug had a 31% faster recovery time than patients who didn't receive the drug. The death rate while using it also went down, from 11% down to 8%. Baricitinib uh, and other drugs could block inflammation and perhaps reduce some of the lung injury are the pneumonias that these patients are, are getting. And if we could do that, that would substantially improve outcomes, we hope. This trial is being conducted at dozens of sites across the U.S., in addition to the San Antonio study site. Despite the early optimism, though, a more subdued response today from Dr. Anthony Fauci, who testified before the Senate. Dr. Fauci said that that study, while significant in a statistical sort of way, is only modest in the medical world in real terms of success. He's hoping they will find better results when they start combining remdesivir with other drugs. And that is already underway and under study at University Hospital. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Take a look with your time saver traffic at this hour. We're trans guide showing us a shot of I-10 and Presa. These are the eastbound lanes where you can see off to the shoulder there. There appears to be some sort of accident with emergency crews are on the scene. Uh, traffic, however, is moving in that direction. Again, I-10 and Presa, the eastbound lanes tonight. Well, after the overwhelming response they got from healthcare workers and the public where they're stationed in Las Vegas, the U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds decided to go national. Tomorrow, their Operation America Strong will be flying right over San Antonio for about half an hour, starting around 1.20 tomorrow afternoon. Jesse Degriado now with a preview of their latest mission in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis. No aerobatics this time, yet the Thunderbirds will be in their Delta formation, barely three feet apart, going about 450 miles an hour, only 500 feet above San Antonio. So we'll be flying uh, fairly low, fairly fast, uh, fairly close. In the left wing position in his F-16 Fighting Falcon will be a Texas Aggie from Wichita Falls with family in San Antonio, where he also earlier trained. Get to bring it back to Texas. We're really excited. I'm really excited about that opportunity. The opportunity, he says, to acknowledge everyone's sacrifice during the pandemic. Whether you have given up some of your freedom and decided to stay at home, or you have been on the front line risking your lives trying to save others, uh, we want to say thank you. From afar, yet in an inspirational, breathtaking way. Even though we're distant, we're still together. And, and that's really the message we're trying to send. In this together is emblazoned on their fighter jets. To be able to do this now, he says, reaching so many people. This is beyond any dream that I've uh, ever had. Jesse De Boyado, KSAT 12 News. Can you imagine going that fast, that close? We're going to see it tomorrow. We have the Thunderbirds flight path and where you can see their flyover tomorrow afternoon on our website at ksat.com. Well, as Adam Kasky mentioned just a moment ago, we are monitoring a severe weather warning. Adam, what's the latest? Well, you can see off in the distance in San Antonio, just some downpours out there on live cam. That's just garden variety run of the mill activity, but we do have a severe thunderstorm warning in central Comal County at this time, and it's basically for a location just south of Canyon Lake right now. Here's a look at the radar screen. You see all this activity even around San Antonio, but the one storm that really blossomed over the past 30 minutes is just outside of Candelia, crossing over 281 north of Bulverde. So the core of this storm is north of Bulverde and basically passing between Canyon Lake 
and Bulverde right along Highway 46 here. I took off the lightning so you can see where the strongest part of the storm is within these orange lines within that orange polygon. If you time it out, it does look like it's going to push to the southeast 25 miles per hour if it remains at this intensity and on this track, it could make it to New Braunfels by 653. But I want to point out New Braunfels is not included in this warning at this time. We need to further monitor this to see if it still is going to be as strong as it heads eastward. But those of you that live right along 281 and 46 and along 46 between uh, 281 and I 35. You want to stay indoors with this one because this is could have winds up to 60 miles per hour and even hail possibly an inch in diameter. Right now the hail that we're uh, measuring with our system is up to about an inch in diameter. That seems to be the primary threat. We're going to keep you updated on this and have much more to come straight ahead. We're just seconds away from our daily briefing with the county judge and Mayor Ron Nuremberg, and it'll be interesting to see what they have to say today, not just the numbers, but also reaction to a statement that was issued by Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, where he basically said a lot of the requirements, including face coverings, uh, some of the gatherings are unconstitutional. Let's listen in. Wolf, tonight we're joined by Dr. Don Emmerich, Director of Metro Health, along with our city attorney, Andy Segovia. And this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we're confirming 1,942 cases of COVID-19. That's an increase of 22 from yesterday. Two of those cases are confirmed from the community, although 11 are pending determination. We do have three new cases at the Bear County Jail and six from other congregate settings that we'll be discussing in just a moment. Uh, Av, tonight we also crossed the 1,000 mark with the number of recoveries from COVID-19 in our community, and the increase is also reflected in our percentages of recovered, and we're up to 53% of all uh, COVID-19 cases in our community uh, as fully recovered. Uh, we have no new deaths, thankfully, to report tonight, and um, we continue to have 44% of cases that are still fighting the disease. Um, so far in our, in our hospitals, the numbers continue to look good. Uh, we have 66 COVID positive patients in the hospital. That has a little bit of an increase over the last couple of days uh, with the number of 20 under investigation for COVID-19 for a total of 86 patients potentially uh, with COVID-19 that are hospitalized. We have unfortunately seen a slight increase in and the number of ICU uh, ICU patients, and we have 43 folks that are on a, in ICU tonight, and 27 on ventilators. But our capacity remains strong: 76% of ventilator capacity and 32% of hospital bed capacity. Uh, you probably we did talk a little bit yesterday, and you've been reading more about the efforts to make sure that our nursing homes are getting fully tested, and we are doing a 100% testing in all the long-term care facilities. There are many of those in our community, and we will be reporting those results every night at 7 p.m. So you can go to uh, the website covid19.sanantonio.gov to look at the latest there. It is important to note that as positives do increase, we are using a cohort facility to make sure that positive residents of nursing homes, as well as staff, are isolated and not, being, not exposing other people in the nursing homes. So as far as residents who are positive, they are being moved to the River, Care, River City Care Center uh, unless they are uh, needing hospitalization. Uh, we do have 19, currently 19 nursing home residents that are currently recovering at River City. At this time, I'll turn it over to Judge Nelson Wolf. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. By the way, the mayor and I received a love letter uh, from the Attorney General this today uh, criticizing the safety measures that we have put in place to uh, save people's lives here in San, in San Antonio. Uh, you'll be having an opportunity to ask questions from the uh, from the attorney in a little while regarding that letter. Uh, but let me just say a couple of things about that. We worked with a spirit of cooperation with the governor since this started. It was a clear understanding when this started that we could enhance the safety measures, which is what we did by making the mandatory uh, use of face masks, by making social distancing mandatory, by making it mandatory for employers to provide the safety measures to their workforce, which is common sense, that being mask and the other protective measures that are necessary. And all of these things were done to uh, prevent the uh, spread of COVID. 
And San Antonio has an outstanding record, better than any other metropolitan area, in saving lives and and re, and coming to this. We've reduced our our doubling rate from I think it was a just every two three days. We reduced it down to uh, I think once every two and a half weeks or so. We've reduced the number of those percent that have uh, COVID from somewhere around 10 or 12 down to six and a half, something like that. Uh, we've done a good job maintaining our hospitals where the peak was on the April 16th, and we brought that down from about 91 to 60 something. But this could not have been happened. This would not be happening uh, without the mandatory safe measures of wearing face mask and keeping social distance. I'm very disappointed in the response that we got today. And there are legal issues pertaining to that, uh, some of which maybe have, um, you know, stopped us from being able to protect people. You'll hear a little. You have the opportunity to ask some questions of the of the of our attorney Andy when you when we get to questions. All right. Thank you very much, Judge. And I can't emphasize enough that the cooperation that we've had around the community has really, in fact, kept people healthy and saved a lot of lives here in San Antonio. So keep up the great work. I do want to mention that testing has expanded to asymptomatic uh, folks here in our community. So you don't need an appointment. You don't need a doctor's order. You can go get a test at many of the clinics that are around San Antonio. You can find out a, or you can see a map of all the testing lo locations in San Antonio at covid San antonio.gov and as a reminder we do have the mobile sites the pop-up sites that are coming available and at the end of the week we will have two sites coming open uh, out south side lions that's 3100 hiawatha as well as at barbara jordan community center at 3803 East uh, Commerce, and those will be open later on the week. And we have Dr. Emmerich here to talk a little bit more about when and where uh, those facilities will be. So that can All right, before we get to the two major takeaways from that press briefing, just want to go over some of these numbers really quickly. A total of one that inching very close to the 2000 mark, yes. by the way, 1,942 total confirmed cases, no new deaths to report. Um, six of those, interestingly enough, were from what he's calling congregate settings. Nursing home Nursing facilities, home is, facilities how, yeah. is our interpretation of what a congregate setting is. And he did say that they will be giving updates. They're doing 100% testing at all of the nursing homes. Uh, and so far, 19 people are recovering at the River City Nursing Home, which is where they're asking people to go so they don't infect other residents. As they test positive, we'll be moved over there is what I'm understanding. Now. Yeah, and we talked about mm -hmm. the Ken Paxton letter. Uh, interesting that County Judge Nelson Wolf calling it a love letter sarcastically and talking about the fact that they're a little confused about why this letter is even coming out. They feel like they've been working in the spirit of cooperation with the state to enhance safety measures done to save lives. He's specifically pointed out face masks and social distancing are done to protect people. So they are a little confused by why it seems like the state of Texas is cracking down on Bear County and San Antonio. Yeah, and he cited that San Antonio has what he calls an outstanding record better than other metro areas in the state, um, and that there's some legal issues pertaining to it. And they have Andy Zagovia, one of the uh, city attorneys there, standing by to take questions on that. Yeah, of course, we'll be continuing to follow that story. We're also continuing to follow the weather story because it is a developing one tonight. A lot of rain out there and also some potentially dangerous situations. Adam. Yeah, right now we have one severe thunderstorm warning that's in effect, and it's basically for an area between Bull Verde and Canyon Lake, right along 281 and 46 where they come together. So let's take a look at the radar screen. Let's take this fall, and you see there is other activity out there, some good soaking rainfall, some lightning and thunder, especially along the coastal plain, Lavaca, DeWitt counties, and uh, moving out of Guadalupe County into Gonzales counties. This is good rainfall, but this is what we have that's severe right now. You see the uh, lightning. This this storm has just uh, really illuminated and really become electrified over the past 30, 45 minutes. And now it's pushing eastward right along Highway 46. I know a lot of you are familiar with that between Bull Verde and New Braunfels. And if you live along that corridor between Bull Verde and New Braunfels along and in the vicinity of 46, you want just want to stay indoors for this one. If you had plans of venturing out in your vehicle, stay indoors. Let this pass. The primary threat, I think, will be some straight line winds potentially up to 60 miles per hour, but we even have the risk of some hail up to the size of quarters, which is damaging, but on the lower end of the damaging hail size. So this is between Canyon Lake, New Braunfels and, um, and Bull Verde moving to the southeast. It can make it to New Braunfels by about 655, assuming it stays, stays on the same trajectory. Right now, our hail product not showing a whole lot out there. Just one little hail core east of Bull Verde with 
diameter of about an inch. So that's a quarter size hail. So we're going to keep a close eye on that storm. We have more activity on the south side of San Antonio, southeast side of town, Elmendorf, Bronning Lake area, all the way around 1604, 281. That is not severe at this time. And actually, Floresville, you're finally getting in on some rainfall. Many other locations did earlier today. You missed out. Now you're getting an opportunity. Good rainfall today for some folks, especially along the aquifer uh, drainage zone and parts of the recharge zone. I mean, we measured over six inches in Canyon Lake and guess what? Canyon Lake, you have another downpour headed through right now. So those lingering storms through the evening coming to an end, I think around 10 PM, give or take. And then at midnight, just low clouds, lingering humidity. And tomorrow we'll start the day at 70, make it to 87 by the afternoon. Cloudy in the morning, sunny later on in the day. Next few days, just a 20% chance of some isolated pop up afternoon storms, but we're focusing on Friday and especially through the weekend on Saturday for the potential of some heavy rain. We'll keep you updated. Thank you, Adam. All right, remember the days when all you had to really worry about were your fantasy leagues, baseball, <laughs> football. Now you got to worry about whether these games are actually ever going to be played, Greg. Yeah, and the, the indication is by the owners, they will play half the season and expand the teams going into the playoffs. But that has not been agreed to by the Major League Baseball Players Association. When we come back, the battle to bring baseball back and the new head coach of Antonian High School, just meant to be, appears, coming up. The fire's still there, the passion's still there. Um, miss the relationships with the kids, miss the relationship with the coaches, uh, just the school community. And I think uh, having an opportunity to go back to a Catholic school uh, just made it that much better. Danny Madrome coming full circle in his coaching career that began at St. Gerard's High School, now coming out of retirement to become the new head football coach at Antonian in Big Board Sports, but first. With NASCAR set to drop the green flag on live racing this Sunday, baseball is trying to make a comeback in July, but not without several issues still to be worked out. Team owners have come up with a proposal that could give baseball back as early as July in home stadiums with spring training in mid-June with 82 instead of 162 games with playoff teams expanding from 10 to 14 teams. But here's where it gets complicated. The owners are proposing a 50-50 split in revenue, and that's believed to be the biggest sticking point in the presentation today to the Major League Baseball Players Association. Money. The MLBPA will counter with salaries prorated for the games remaining for millionaires who play the game in the new world now with coronavirus. Here are some of the proposals that are on the table. It includes a 50-50 revenue split in 2020, 82 game schedule, 14 team playoffs, no fans in the stands, home stadiums if allowed by local or state jurisdictions, and a designated hitter in both the American League and the National League. As baseball is trying to salvage at least half of their season in playoffs, the NBA is still debating to restart or cancel and to end the NBA Players Association and has decided to gauge the reaction of all of their players. Now, according to ESPN, the NBA PA representatives started texting all NBA players today, including the Spurs, with a simple yes or no question, do you want to try and play again this season with the individual player responses to be kept confidential? But The Athletic is reporting late today the NBA PA is denying that it's taking place. After retiring as a head coach of the Texas Lutheran Bulldogs in 2016, Danny Padron thought his coaching career was over. But now at 68 years of age, the longtime San Antonio area high school coach has decided to come out of retirement to become the new head football coach at Antonian High School. That's after Van Fushak decided to retire in February after nine seasons with the Apaches, ending with a trip to the Taps Division I state semifinals last year. Padron began his coaching career as an assistant at St. Gerard's, where he became the head coach in 1975. Later stints at Clark, Judson back to Clark before becoming the head coach at O'Connor High School in 2002 and later to Seguin to become the head coach at TLU in 2010. Now after three and a half years on the sideline, he's ready to get back into the game and told us how it happened. I worked for at St. Matthew's, uh, our pastors, Father Dennis and Father Dennis Oretica, and uh, he had asked me before, he said, uh, would you ever go back into coaching? And I said, yeah, I sure would. And uh, it was one of those type deals where it just happened, you know, things happen especially at Antonia, and that's, that was a school that, uh, you know, is very close in our neighborhood, and like I said, it's a Catholic school. Uh, so, yeah, that was probably the only place I would go, and it just happened that it worked out. 
And one of Padron's first moves as a new head coach in Antonio was to hire Brian Dowson as the assistant head coach and defensive coordinator, the same Brian Dowson who led Roosevelt to the state championship in 1995, later was a head coach of both Marshall and Warren High Schools before becoming the defensive line coach at TLU the last two seasons. So good to have everybody back in place. Now we can just get through this pandemic and get everybody back together again this fall. That would be great. Yeah, let's just concentrate on football. Exactly. Yeah, thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. Separating the facts from the fear out there. It's what we were attempting to do every day at this time with our coronavirus Q&A. And we are very happy as we are most Tuesdays to be joined by Dr. Ruth Bergeron from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio, an infectious disease doctor. Doctor, thank you for being with us. Uh, a question I have is on timing that I want to ask you about right off the top. When will we know we're reopening things now? When do we need to look down the road to see if we're reopening too quickly or if things are going well? Are we talking about a couple of weeks? Yeah, so, you know, we talk about the 14 day incubation period. So you would expect not to see too much happening before at least one incubation period has gone past after the relaxing of the restrictions. And then it would go from there. So it's a little early now um, to, say, to, to take the temperature of San Antonio. Um, but when we get to 14 days past real relaxing of the restriction, then we should be, take a look around and we'll be looking at a number of parameters. We'll be looking at is are we starting to see a more rapid doubling of the number of cases? Are we seeing an increase in the percentage of positive cases? And is the health system beginning to show signs of stress? Are they starting to see more calls, more emergency calls that are COVID related? Are they running out of PPE and that sort of thing? So we're, it's too early. Um, to take the temperature, um, 14 days is about the right time frame and beyond. I want to ask you about asymptomatic testing. It's something that is now available to anyone here in San Antonio, as the mayor has been um, telling us for the past several days during this briefing. Who should get a test and what do those results mean? So um, great question. Thanks for asking it. And it can be confusing. I, I don't think that just everybody should rush to one of our seven free testing sites in the city and just say, test me, test me, I'm asymptomatic. We need to think strategically. The test should be used by people who care for those who are medically vulnerable. Now, that doesn't mean you're a professional healthcare worker. It could mean that you're somebody who takes care of an older person in your own home, your mom or your auntie. Okay, so if you are somebody who comes into daily contact with an individual who has underlying organ disease like heart, lung disease, kidney disease, um, coronary artery disease, transplant patients, dialysis patients, if you're one of those kinds of people, you might want to get tested. I spoke to a young man this afternoon who told me that he cares for his mom who's who's on dialysis and he's asymptomatic. He said, do you think I should get tested? So we went through. What would happen if, if he goes and he gets tested right now as an asymptomatic person and it comes back positive, um, he should assume that he's potentially infectious to his mom and really to anybody else. That's why we have the masking recommendation. So he should continue to do what he's already doing, which is wearing a mask. But if he's in a non-essential role, meaning that he, he can telework from home, he should self-isolate. And ideally, he should isolate as far away from the person he's concerned about as he can. You know, we're starting to see that isolation inside homes isn't working all that well. So if someone has the capacity, Steve, uh, to isolate in another building altogether, um, go, to a, go to a friend's condo that's vacated or go to a hotel room, that would be better. So yeah. the asymptomatic person, 10 days, 10 days of isolation um, before going back to work. And you've got to monitor your symptoms during that time, because if you become symptomatic, now you turn into a different kind of fish. Now you're a symptomatic person. And now you've got to stay home for seven days and have three days of no fever before you can go back to work. The, we, you, you talked about being separated, and that's why they have a separate nursing home set up for just some of these uh, people that have tested positive in the nursing homes. Uh, we've been talking about how it seems like different nursing homes are popping up with positive, uh, positive cases. Is that concerning to you, or do you feel now that that's expected? 
Well, it's predictable, but I don't think we should ever say it's expected, and it is concerning. So we don't have visitors going into nursing homes, and the virus doesn't just pop in out of nowhere, so it has to be getting brought in. So who's it being brought in by? It's got to be coming in from the workers who are not coming in if they have symptoms, because every single nursing home I visited was doing a fantastic job of screening people at the door, and you don't come in the door if you have a temperature greater than 100 or if you answer yes to any of the questions. So that means workers who are asymptomatic and don't know they have it must have brought it in there. So we should pay attention. Asymptomatic spread is a thing. Now that testing's opening up, now that we have more capacity in the city, which is a really wonderful thing, we need to start testing the asymptomatic workers who work in homes where there's been a case. And until those cases get under control, there needs to be recurrent testing of asymptomatic workers so that we can keep them away. Dr. Berger, and I know our producer is asking us to wrap here, but I still want to ask you really quickly about churches. Now that the Archbishop has opened up churches, a lot of other denominations are opening up as well. Um, what should folks look out for when they're assessing whether to bring their families into that church environment? Yeah, I think Medically first, speaking, of course. Yeah, think about who we're trying to protect. And, you know, 80% of the folks who die are the people over 65 years old. So let's protect those people. And I would strongly recommend that if you are over 65, please do your worship service online um, and let the younger folks go into the congregate settings. But once you're in the congregate setting, the, so the physical distancing is really important. Families should sit, sit six feet apart from other families. People should wear masks. It protects the other. And hand washing is important. There should be hand sanitizer everywhere. People should be wiping down those high touch surface areas with good cleaning products. And don't cough into your hands. That's so hard to remember. We're, we're human and we have habits, right? Cough like this. When you cough in your hand, you often forget that you coughed and then you touch other people, you shake their hands, and that is how the virus spreads. Dr. Ruth Bergeron, UT Health San Antonio, thank you. Of course, she'll, she'll be taking your questions tonight on the news at 9 that we will replay then on the night beat at 10. Thank you, Dr. Bergeron. We'll be right back. All right, we've got a new developing weather situation oh, wow. we want to get to. Look at those clouds from live camp looking towards downtown. Yeah, those clouds are just basically some showers that we've had around uh, the south side of San Antonio and elsewhere. But we do have a new severe thunderstorm warning, which includes the city of Cuero in DeWitt County, and that is until 7.15 p.m. There could be some large hail with that cell. That's moving to the east-southeast as uh, progressing through DeWitt County. We still have that warning for southern Comal County that's moving toward the I-35 corridor. We'll give you a whole roundup, update you on everything, and let you know how much rain fell today coming up. All right, we have a very active weather day out there. Uh, some warnings to tell us about right now, Adam. Yeah, we do. We have uh, actually now down to one severe thunderstorm warning. That's in DeWitt County for including the city of Cuero. It looks like the strongest part of that storm is heading right toward the city of Cuero. So if you're in the vicinity of Cuero, you definitely just need to stay inside, seek shelter. Don't go venturing out. Don't go looking at this. I want to show you what we were uh, what we were experiencing in Bulverde. This is from that downpour and even that thunderstorm that had this severe warning on it and this was some very heavy rainfall that was just coming down in sheets and we've seen a lot of that in Comal County today. Here's the wide view. You go west of town along the Rio Grande. You had some storms in Mexico. They're falling apart. You can probably see the clouds from them. Don't worry about them. Eagle Pass, Camado, Del Rio. Nothing to worry about there. The activity right now is along the coastal plain, and this particularly is in Cuero. That's where we have the primary threat right now. Maybe some wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour and some isolated spots here. Obviously, a lot of lightning and thunder, so there could be some power outages when you have those lightning strikes. That's always a concern, and we keep getting these lightning strikes coming in. And when you see these lightning strikes really increase in quantity in a short amount of time, it's usually an indication that you're seeing some strengthening with the storm. Right now, we're looking at a hail core with this, and we're looking at hail possibly one to one and a half inches in diameter, and that's located just a few miles south of Lindo. And I'll give you actually an idea of how far away it is from Cuero, the city of Cuero. This hail core is just, I mean, we're talking five, six miles 
from Quero there. So this is uh, a heavy duty hail core that we're watching as it moves to the east at about 20 miles per hour. Now, the center of the hail core, it, it changes a bit as the storm moves. Should the hail hit the city of Quero, you'd get it at about 657. So in about 10 minutes from now, as that moves eastward. So that's what we're watching with this one. A lot of lightning and thunder, but the potential for some damaging hail with that as well. And then you go up into Gonzales, you've got some heavy rainfall. Hallettsville, you just had heavy rainfall. None of this is severe at the moment. A lot of lightning and thunder, some snap, crackle, pop, but mostly just good rainfall. The warning that we had in Kamal County has since expired. And now we're just looking at the leftovers of heavy rainfall, lightning and thunder, maybe some wind gusts, 40, 45 miles per hour as that approaches Green and New Braunfels, Garden Ridge right now. And there could be a little bit of pea to dime size hail left over. It's not damaging hail, nothing to worry about. So right now it's good that we've seen this particular storm dissipate and not have the same strength that it did even just 30, 45 minutes ago. Other parts of San Antonio, even just south of SeaWorld here, we've got some good rainfall, 1604 and 90, some good downpours, and even on the south side of San Antonio and south side of Bear County, uh, and even into Wilson County, good rainfall, heavy rainfall that's taking place on the back side of this broad upper level circulation. This was the smallest circulation that could, and it did. It overperformed, which is good in terms of rainfall around here. We had over six inches of rain already around Canyon Lake, over five inches in Bull Verde. At the airport, two tenths of an inch th thus far. Here's our overall pattern. And what we have lined up are more impulses in our atmosphere that are actually going to intensify a bit and amplify. So that means they'll just gain more muscle as they head our way. And that's going to increase our rain chances by the end of the week and into the weekend. This has been good for the aquifer, the placement of the rain. I know some of you are watching saying, well, I didn't get any rain, You're right? Not everybody did. It's one of those situations as we come and see, but look at this as when it comes down to the aquifer, the recharge zone, the drainage zone, we want the rain within these red lines here. And look at that. We got it in the sweet spot for the most part of the aqua aquifer should be responding. Clearly some rain cooled air, 60s northeast of town, 90 in the sunshine southwest of town and closer to the Rio Grande. Tomorrow I think we'll be well into the 80s after a morning low of 70. Low morning clouds will lead to afternoon sun and maybe a few pop up storms. And by the way, the storms this evening should be dissipating by about 10 p.m. But we'll be here and we'll be even live on our KSAT Weather Authority app if there's any breaking weather as well. So we'll be on top of that. Otherwise, the next chance for real widespread rain and more numerous showers and storms Friday later in the day and right now, especially into Saturday. Remember we talked about that a little bit yesterday. We were watching Saturday. We've increased those chances. We like what we see right now, but there could be a little too much of a good thing. So we'll keep you updated. It's a fluid situation and I give you the very latest as it comes in. Yeah, right. too, too much of a good thing. Yes. <laughs> Seems to be the way it usually happens in South Texas. Thank you, Adam. We'll be right back. Texas Governor Greg Abbott says he is concerned about those who are most vulnerable to the coronavirus. He joined David Sears and Ursula Perry live from Austin during our noon newscast. He talked about testing for nursing home residents in particular. He also touched on overall testing and even child care. David Sears with a wrap up of that conversation. We have several concerns. One is uh, that the nursing home setting is, is a setting that's proven to be one uh, of the most dangerous as it concerns COVID-19. And that is why Governor Greg Abbott is taking the recommendation of the president's task force on the coronavirus, having all residents of senior care living facilities and their staffs across Texas tested for COVID-19. That way they can separate those testing negative from those testing positive and treat the ones with positive tests. There are two other main goals. One is uh, we will reduce the number of people testing positive for COVID-19 in Texas, but also more importantly, uh, we will reduce the fatalities in Texas, which by the way, are among the lowest in the United States. And while there is that effort throughout the state, here in San Antonio, tests are being made available to everyone without symptoms. Another statewide goal, because of what the governor says it's going to reveal. There's gonna be actually far more people in San Antonio and elsewhere in the state who actually have had COVID-19, but never even knew about it. What that really means is this, and that is the, the death rate and the positive test rate is actually far lower than what people think, meaning that the disease is far less lethal than what people think. 
While some businesses opened last week and more businesses are expected to open next week, there are still some employees dealing with child care issues. The governor and his medical staff are trying to figure things out because there are so many kids coming from so many different home settings. There's so many different exposures involved in this. We've got to find a way to do it, but do it safely. David Sears, KSAT 12 News. Before we go, one last live look outside with CityCam. It is gray outside. Look at that. Yeah, and that's looking up towards our friends in New Braunfels and up towards Comal County, Guadalupe County. And uh, I'm hoping that's just rainfall for them. Rain, some lightning has more uh, bark than bite, if you will. You know, it yeah. looks more ominous than it really is. It's just a lot of heavy soaking rain, which I know a lot of folks are welcoming because we need the rainfall. We're still in a drought and we're abnormally dry in many locations that aren't in a drought. So this is falling in some good spots and also filling up the aquifer a little bit. And we've got more rain to come, but you still have that severe thunderstorm warning for the city of Quero, Quero Central DeWitt County. And that's until 715 PM. We're going to keep an eye on this activity and just for the off chance that uh, another severe storm happens to develop. But next focus is the weekend for rain. Thank you, Adam.